don't expect uh, this meetup to be particularly uh, informative or instructive for anyone, but uh, it's, um, yeah, we are doing it online. We, are, we have the possibility of recording it, so why not? That's what I thought. And uh, if you guys all agreed, and I guess you did, now we are recording our event. So uh, let me just check um, uh, a little detail. I want to be precise on what, kind, what number of the meetup this is. So let me check the meetup. I think it's a number 124. Yes, so this is meetup 124 of the Dutch closure meetup. Uh, and uh, if you never heard that from me, this is a consecutive amount of months we are having the meetup in the Netherlands or online, apparently. So, yay, um, this is probably one of the oldest meetups, uh, closure meetups around. Um, so today we are doing this, uh, let's call it an experiment, online experiment for the meetup because uh, we don't, nobody wants to get sick. Uh, we are actually, uh, we cannot make the, the event in person, so uh, here we are. And uh, I did try to uh, to arrange for something better, probably, uh, in terms of uh, schedule for the event, having um, presentations and recording things and something like that, and nothing about um, So that's uh, just that. Uh, that means that as a uh, new person. Uh, okay, so in, in terms of an agenda, uh, as uh, kind of usual for this meetup, we do not have an agenda, so we will have to understand to make one as we go. Yes, Tim join. Hi, Tim. Um, so yeah, we will have to, to yeah, make the best out of this, uh, this uh, time that we have and see what can we do uh, interesting tonight. Uh, um, I do not have many proposals at the moment, so I would like to do uh, a, a round table to see if anybody has good ideas of what to do. Um, okay, so I thought that somebody wanted to already present something. That would have been awesome, actually, but um, yeah. So anybody has an interesting idea to, uh, to how to, to invest this, uh, this meetup time? Ooh, shy audience, huh? And there was silence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I see people are enjoying some some food in in the meanwhile. So enjoy that, Herod. Um. So yeah. Um. I do not have um. Unfortunately, nothing myself to to present. Mm. Otherwise, that would have been the easiest thing. Michael. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can show something that I made, but uh, I don't want to be the guy that always takes over the meetup. <laughs> well, you, if, if you want to look at it from my perspective, you are my savior, because, you know, if, <laughs> if I come to the meetup without an agenda, then I, I can't rely on you having interesting okay. content to, to share. So I Okay, let me, let me just show something for 20 minutes, and in the meanwhile, uh, someone else can maybe think about what they want to show. Sure. Like uh, just just to break the ice, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm working on an open source tool called uh, Babeshka, and uh, Babeshka is a scripting tool for closure. Uh, maybe I could share my screen. Does that work in in this? Yes, thing? it should work. Let's see. Present now, maybe your entire screen. Yep. Yeah. Let me try that. Uh, okay. Can you, yeah, can you see yes. my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, I, I, I actually don't have anything prepared, so uh, it's all improvised. So it's now 10 past seven, so let me just chat until half past seven, and then someone else can take it over. So what I've been doing uh, last two weeks is, uh, so Babeshka is a tool, let me, 
just quickly show something and make my screen a little bit larger. So can you see this? Yep. Yeah, I can zoom in mo even more if you want. So Babeshka is a tool which allows you to execute closure expressions in near in instant startup. So this is like a closure expression and you can then execute it and you get the answer six. And it's it's uh, pretty instantaneous. So it's like you can see it's 13 milliseconds. And so this is pretty useful for uh, scripting. And uh, so Babeshka is uh, made to replace bash scripts. That, that's basically the idea to replace bash scripts with closure. Uh, so you can like feed the input from one bash command into uh, DB if you want. Whoops, sorry, that was a mistake. Uh, so you can, for example, ls you can do, and the minus i flag says, well, I'm reading from a bash command. And this is the input. And then you get the input as a list of lines. And if you say minus O, then it prints the, the output as, as lines as well. So here we just pass through the input from LS to BB, and then we print again. So that, that's how you can use it. But you can also make scripts. So if you uh, have something like this, um, so this is, Bebeshka has all kinds of libraries combined with it. And also close your data CSV, for example. So you can do uh, CSV and then read. Uh, I don't know, I have to look it up. But what I've been doing in the last two weeks is add um, NREPL server to Babeshka. And NREPL is a protocol uh, which is, uh, uh, invented to communicate from your editor with a REPL uh, using messages. And uh, so th that is what I've been adding in the last two weeks. So I can show uh, maybe that. So Babeshka is just a binary. So it's, uh, I, I put it in, in a bin folder here. So it's just a binary and it's 43 megabytes. And this is all you need. So it's self-contained and you don't need a JVM. So it's only the binary. So this now uh, bundles the NREPL server. So you can start a server and now it started. And now I can connect from my editor. So I do CIDR connect. Then I fill in the right port number and I already have some buffer that it will reuse. So I'm closing it right away because I, I'm just evaluating from my buffer here. So now I do plus one to three and it prints six. So this is not normal closure. This is now connected to this program here that I just started. So, but to show that uh, Babeshka also has closure CSV, the library, so you can, uh, do, and it also supports, the NREPL protocol also supports um, uh, auto completion. So, uh, so if I press tab here, you see here that it will suggest, well, you can do read CSV or write CSV. Those are, are all the functions in this namespace. So if I type this, it will auto complete it. And maybe it's also possible to, if you type a space, that it will suggest like the arcs uh, list. I, I haven't implemented that yet. So that's maybe a nice addition. But uh, I also support like doc strings and stuff in BB, but I didn't add them for everything. So I, I'm not sure if I can look up the doc string for closure CSV. Let me try it. Uh, read CSV. Oh, <laughs> that didn't work. So I have to look it up online. Closure CSV. This one. Read CSV. So let's just see. 
this function is oh yeah so it has inputs yeah what is input uh oh so it is a protocol so it has a protocol read csv from so that can also read from a string apparently so let's tr try that so um i know i have a, a csv file around in my downloads folder so let's see here so there is um there is a health organization which now publishes uh, CSV files, uh, which I downloaded for my work yesterday. So I can take a look at that maybe. Uh, <coughs> users, uh, board group downloads so this one. So now it will parse this entire CSV file into memory. And it, that will take a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's an error. So maybe uh, I can also do IO reader and then, uh, oh, yeah. Babeshka also has closure Java IO. Now I do this. Um, let's see. This works. CSV and then maybe first. So I think it's lazy. So let's try it. Yeah, that works. So there is an error somewhere in this file that is not compatible with the uh, closure data CSV. But so this. So now I'm developing this script from my editor. So that is what I have been editing. So it's the NREPL support that you can just connect from Emacs or connect from uh, Calva or a VS Code or uh, whatever editor that supports an REPL protocol. And if, when you're done with your script, you can uh, just run it from the command line. So you can now say temp foo. And now you see the same result that I had in my uh, REPL. And it's still uh, very fast. So maybe I can show how the N REPL protocol works if that is interesting, because uh, you're probably using the NREPL protocol uh, in your, in your uh, work when you work with normal closure as well. So maybe that is interesting to look at for a little bit. And then we can maybe look at how I implemented this. So I have the code and REPL server. So the entire server code is 230 lines. And uh, what I can do is start in development mode and then just print all the messages that, that are received and that are sent. Maybe that's nice. So now I will start uh, Babeshka but not from the binary, but using normal closure KVM. Oh, uh, but Bashka def is true. And then you can do line VB. Now it starts the same program, but not compiled to a binary, just in the KVM. And I have one flag that says, well, I'm in development mode, so print some stuff. And I think, I don't print what I sent because uh, that was too much output, but I can add that back just for for now. And then we can maybe connect from uh, lining or something. Uh, so you can do line REPL connect. So this will, will act as a NREPL client, which is then connecting to my NREPL server. I'm connecting and it will already, it will ask for the NREPL core func version, but I don't have that in Babeshka. I don't have a dependency on NREPL core. So that is why it sends, uh, shows an exception here. It's not very important, but you can already see that uh, the messages 
that uh, the server received and what it sent back. So here I received one message from the client and it says op clone and op means operation and clone is the clone operation. And that means that the client wants a new uh, NREPL session. So what the server then can do is just make up some ID that will represent this uh, session. And then it sends back, well, this is your new session ID. And, and NREPL also has a status. And if it's, it's a list of things, and if that contains done, then the client knows it doesn't have to read more messages for this operation. It's, uh, it's finished. And apparently Lightning and sends the clone operation twice. I don't know why, but uh, it does. And then Lightning and tries to uh, ask if I want to evaluate some code on my server. So here Lightning and says, I want to uh, evaluate this code. And it, it searches for something like rep, Reply. But I don't have that in Babeshka. So um, I don't see an error about this. But apparently, Lightning and tries to find out something about my about the environment that it connects to, what it can do. And here also, it, it tries to do all kinds of stuff but because it expects a normal closure implementation. But let's just ignore all these messages for now. And let's just see if we can evaluate plus one, two, three from the Lightning and REPL client. So I sent plus one to three and I got back six. And here we see this is a lot uh, easier to read. So here Lightning and says, okay, evaluate this code for me. And inside this session, and I have some ID as well. And the ID is sent from uh, also from the client. The client makes up an ID. And when it receives back a message, it has the same ID. So the client knows that this reply belonged to this, uh, up to the request that it sent. So now, uh, so my server sends this answer. Well, the answer to this uh, message is value six for this code. And then it sends another message, done. So you don't have to send all everything in one message. You can send multiple messages. And if you want to do that, you can uh, eventually send status done. And then the client knows, well, this is all I have to read. So uh, let's do something Babeshka specific maybe, because Babeshka has a library called Babeshka curl, which is a wrapper around curl. So now you know this is not normal closure anymore. It's, it is indeed that we're talking to this server and not, not some JVM, normal JVM closure. So we can do curl get, let's see, closure.org or something, response. Now we get back the response. Let's see what's in the response. Okay, status, headers, and body. Uh, let's do status from the response. That's 200 headers, response. Okay, so you see that I can define things in the session and it's all remembered throughout, throughout all the evaluations. So the state, the, uh, the NREPL server has to remember all of this inside a, yeah, some state for each uh, session. Uh, and you see, let's see. So here we have, um, so here, oh yeah, here I defined def response, curl get, et cetera. And, uh, and this is the response. But meanwhile, between this request and between this uh, reply, of course, in the server, now there is a var defined that is called uh, response. 
Um, I can also define namespaces, of course, and then do the same thing again. But now you see that the, the let's see, so I had a problem with uh, while implementing this NREPL server because some clients do send the namespace in which they're in. Uh, like, and but some clients do not, and I expected that uh, all the clients had the, the NS value, so I had to also make. Uh, I did two releases, one without, and one where I fixed these these bugs. But now most of the, a lot of editors already uh, work with Babeshka now, so one guy. Let me look it up, maybe. It's uh, maybe nice. Uh, Vim Ice. So there is an author for uh, Vim, uh, which who made a Vim plugin for Closure, and he's some Japanese guy, I think, or Chinese. I don't. I <laughs> think he's me. Japanese. Uh, uh, he's the author Japan of the Mizaki uh, yeah. static sub generator for Closure. Yeah. Yeah, and now he, uh, like the same day that I released this, he uh, made a change to, to Vim Ice as well to uh, support this. So now Vim Ice can also connect to uh, Babeshka and evaluate stuff. So uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, and also Calva will uh, add more support for it. And so maybe like briefly skim over the code. Like uh, I have two minutes minutes left, which I gave myself. So <laughs> so this is like the the session for each. So each client can initiate a session, and then once you have a session, you get inside this loop, and these are all the operations that it can can uh, receive. So it's clone, eval, load file complete so for the autocompletes and describe which is uh, like describe what this server can do but it's it's pretty ad hoc i think what you should should uh, respond on this message so i the nrepl protocol is not very well documented so what i did mostly is look at at this output so insider, you have nrepl messages buffer, and there you can just see what what the communication between the client and the server is. Uh, so I mostly implemented this by watching uh, existing communication between working nrepl servers and and clients. So yeah. You, uh, one one last thing as a dessert. <laughs> uh, so at my work, we have uh, we have a REPL in production. Oh, somebody just reset uh, Team City. <laughs> uh, let's hope it finishes soon. Um, but what I basically did, I can also show it differently. Let's. Yeah, let, let me try that. So what I basically did is uh, write a Babeshka script, which connects to an existing REPL, and then evaluates one ex expression uh, just to trigger like an activity. Uh, because we in our application, we have an uh, application cache. And sometimes we just need to clear the cache for some reason. So I just made a script in our uh, CI environment to connect to our production REPL and then clear the application cache using just a closure expression. I did it uh, exactly uh, using the, the NREPL protocol. So let, I have a, a small example of that here. Um, so, and the NREPL protocol is built on top of uh, the Ben code 
and encoding. So Ben code is library for encoding uh, uh, hash maps and strings and collections to binary data. And uh, Ben code is also used in, I think, uh, BitTorrent stuff. Uh, but they chose this protocol because it's very simple and it exists, uh, support for it exists in a lot of uh, languages. So all, all the messages that are sent back and forth are Ben code messages. So uh, let's see, Ben code. Yeah, so I have only two functions, write Ben code and read Ben code. And so that's, that is what happening here. So it's just a hash map, which is written to, to Ben code. Uh, let me, oh yeah, I can, I can show, because I also included the Ben code library in Babeshka now. So you can write, you can write uh, NREPL client as a Babeshka script if you want. So write Ben code. And it only understands string keys and not keywords. So it's a little bit low level, but oh, oh yeah, I have to write to some some uh, object. Let's see. Java IO string writer. This works and then the string. Something like this, output stream. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, output stream. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, what you can do is connect to some, some NREPL uh, server and then write, Ben code to it, and the operation is then eval, and then you just write some string, and then you read the message, and then you convert the, the message back to a string. And so if I start a server with line REPL, I can just uh, evaluate this in against that running server. Uh, so I can maybe... Just paste this in my script and show that it, that it works. Um, so let's that now. Let, let's just create a normal JVM closure and REPL instance. So this is a normal JVM and REPL server. Um, why don't I get a REPL? Uh, let's see. Maybe it's because I'm connected to Hangouts that it's becoming a little bit weird. But so let's see if this works, and then I'll I'll stop the presentation. Um, let's see, BB foo. Because something is hanging here. I don't know. Uh, I don't know why does. Let's try again. So maybe it needs a project or something. I don't know. Let's, let's ignore that for now. I'm starting a normal JVM REPL, which is running on this port. Yeah, now I get a REPL. So this is like a Java version. Like system get property. This is normal Java. Now I will try to connect to this Java and REPL using a Babeshka script. Let's try it again. Hey, it worked. Oh, that's my presentation. <laughs> Uh, any questions? We did have uh, a question on the chat, I think. Oh, ah, OK. So I'll look at the chat, and then let's see where is the chat. OK, yeah. Uh, OK. 
what do you mean with ad hoc? Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I tried when I uh, wanted to implement it, the NREPL server, I looked at the documentation, but the documentation is pretty, uh, let's say, it doesn't go into great depth of what you should implement. So it only gives gives a brief description. So here you have the operations, clone, and uh, I didn't even implement close, I see now. But so it, for example, here, uh, describe uh, what should you return. And it says a map of operations, but it doesn't say what the keys of the map should be and what the values of the map should be, for example. So it's completely, yeah, you, you don't have much to go by when you implement this. So, and then I started asking around in the, uh, some Slack channels that are about NREPL. And uh, they basically told me, yeah, it's better to just reverse engineer <laughs> what's already implemented instead of looking at these, these specs. So that is what I mean with ad hoc. And also, well, yeah, you can return anything in here and there is no, like, uh, you cannot expect, like, if someone implements NREPL 0.7.0 or something, that, that this has a certain format or something. It's just all uh, a little bit uh, informal. I would say. So, Thank any more questions? Well, I have a, have a question. If okay. there's time. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I haven't used Babashka myself, but I understand you have uh, uh, some pre compiled libraries in your binary. Yeah. Um, what if I wanted to use a library that was not pre compiled in it? Yeah, how, how good do we question. Do that? Yeah, um, so as long as you uh, have a library that only contains uh, the the subset of closure that Babeshka supports, then you can also use that as an external library. So let me look up an example. Um, so for example, uh, Medley, do you know that one? So Medley is a library which has useful closure functions, uh, which are not in standard closure core. So this is not inside Babeshka, but you can load this one uh, using the class path. So here we, we create a class path using some tool, some existing tool, in this case, closure, but you can also use Leiningen, and we save that into a, a, a environment variable. So the first time it's it takes one second, but the second time it's instant because Closure has a caching of class path calculation. So that is why it's still suited for scripting. And now with this variable set, I will show what's inside this. So it has has this class path now. But the important part is, is this one, because that is where the Medley library is. So if I now go into Babeshka and then do require Medley, let's see, what's the namespace again, dot core. Now I can do index by is, for example, a function from Medley, and that works. So as, but this only works because this library doesn't use any uh, anything that is, that Babeshka doesn't support that is not inside the binary. So there is no weird dependency on some Java, uh, let's say, some weird Java library that is not in the standard uh, Java libraries. So yeah, right. So in the, in that regard, it works, uh, but it. You cannot uh, use any classes that are not inside Babeshka. So Babeshka has a list of classes 
that are uh, pre-compiled with it. And this is uh, the entire list. So we have Java IO file, input stream, et cetera, et cetera. So as long as your library only uses these classes, then you're fine. OK, cool. Thank you. Cool. Any more questions? And that's a no, I guess. All right. All right. So thank you very much, Michiel, for your presentation. Okay. Always, uh, always informative and nice. So um, in terms of what, what to do next, I do have an idea myself, but I first would like to pin your brains to see if anybody thought of something awesome to do right now. Any ideas? Be creative. No, uh, I, I don't know if it's awesome, but uh, I've been working on a game framework using Integrant, so that might be interesting to show. But I don't, I don't really have have it prepared. But I could uh, show it. Oh, that that will make it more enjoyable, I would say. Uh, sure, right? I I would like to to actually see that. I never used Integrant myself, so uh, that can be also a good way to introduce that. Thing, to me at least, unless anybody is really against the gaming with closure. Right, so that's, uh, you're good to go, I guess. Okay, uh, well, hi everyone. Um, so a little introduction into what, I, what I'm working on. Let me just prepare this. Um, I'm working on, okay, let me first explain, or well, first of all, I'm working on a game framework, which uh, runs on Clojure and Clojure Script. And the idea is that uh, there's a couple of things. One is that it's supposed to be data driven. So you try to describe as much as you can in data as what does your game represent. And then the actual implementation is done uh, through multi-methods. Um, and then the other thing is uh, the idea is that it's very modular. So you create these components, which can be reused. And the third part is that um, you should be able, uh, there, there's an ab abstraction layer so uh, where um, this framework has this interface that you can use to draw sprites and um, do things like physics and um, things like transitions and basic game development things that you would want to do. And you create modules that talk to this abstraction layer um, because you, if you want to use both Java and JavaScript, you would have to use um, a Java, JavaScript graphics library or a um, Java graphic, graphics library. So you create modules in the in either JavaScript or Java, and then that talk to this interface. So it's, it's a bit like how Ring has an extra abstraction. You know, these web servers have to um, uh, actually work with that, and then you can actually use different things. So let me just share my screen. Uh, I think this would be the best option. Let's see. Uh, hmm. Let's see if this works out. Uh, does this work? Can you see my Emacs? Uh, yes. OK. Uh, for some reason, I can't share my entire screen. Uh, I might need to use a different browser. So once I start showing some graphics, I will um, refresh the browser, I think. Uh, so the, but I'll first um, show you the structure and the basic idea behind it. So um, your game is um, uh, defined with multiple scenes and a scene could be a menu scene or um, a scene where you uh, actually play the game or an end scene. Uh, a scene could also be a user interface uh, and you can uh, layer them on top of each other. So they're basically a environment that you're in currently. 
uh, a scene has multiple uh, entities and an ent entity is um, basically uh, something that um, is composed and I'll just draw this out of multiple components and these things are uh, a component is basically a uh, a collection or, or uh, a container of state so it holds um, for example the position of an entity the current health of an entity um, basic stats maybe items or equipment or other things basically uh, you have all these different um, concerns and component and components um, individually take care of those concerns and so if you have an entity you can compose different components uh, onto that entity which actually defines it and this is where it gets a little bit more um, complex uh, a component is so a component holds state uh, and that's all it really does it just holds state uh, but you of course need to be able to do something with that so you for example have um, multiple handlers for a component uh, what an, what a handler done is handler that's basically a um, a function that handles a message and changes the component state then you have uh, middleware and what that does is it intercepts any in events and then changes them as um, you would like so for example let's say you have a component that manages your health uh, maybe you have an invincibility state where you don't actually take damage. So instead of managing everything in your handler, you could have a invincibility middleware that um, changes the damage of the events to zero. So you can add functionality to events through um, middleware without having to change the handler. Uh, you have reactors. And what a reactor is, if the component state changes, then you do something. So handlers handle events, change the state. If the state actually changes, then any reactors uh, attached to this component will trigger. And so, for example, let's say a handler um, gets an event that the component gets damaged. Um, you lose 5 HP. You react the reactor sees, OK, you lost some HP, so now I need to do the damage animation so you have this uh, again this concern is separated uh, from the handler for if something changes do something based on on that change and last one is you have a ticker and a ticker is just something that happens over time so for example you could be poisoned and you could lose hp over time and this is something that's kind of separated from uh, this part because it has nothing to do with events uh, but it's also just another thing that if if you have something that happens over time, it doesn't really fit in either a handler, middleware, or reactor. So you have a, a separate thing for that. Uh, this is basically for for one part what it looks like uh, in terms of uh, structure. So the idea is that it's it's supposed to be defined in code. So here um, we have a scene start, and it has one entity, which is called my loader. And my loader is a graphics 2D entity, which um, is a sprite sheet loader. So the, the basic thing that this does is it loads a sprite sheet from images texture JSON, and it transitions to the play scene. So once your assets have been loaded, it transitions to the next scene. So, so a, a entity doesn't have to be a player or an enemy or something. It can be anything that um, has a certain task, for example, loading assets. Uh, then it transitions to the play scene, um, and it reference and this has one entity as well, which is a entity player, and that is de defined down here. Uh, so this is an actual player that. Um, really does something so for example it has two components one component is an actual sprite so uh, you need to be able to see the player so you have a sprite component that handles things like animation 
uh, drawing at the correct place, uh, handles position, that kind of thing. And then here we have a custom component that we made, uh, which is called component hell. And you give it arguments saying, um, I expect this component to have 10 health. So we can look at um, the implementation of this component. Or first, um, the, the, the data is also interesting. So th this is really the data definition of the health component. So here we have a reactor which says, is the player or is this component dead? So it has a dead question mark key. Uh, so if HP is zero, basically, then it's uh, this gets triggered. Uh, and also has a handler, which is called damage. So whenever a uh, a damage event is emitted to this handler. Um, it updates your uh, current health. Um, here's the definition of the handler, uh, which then has middleware. So for example, armor, which reduces the damage by a certain amount. And here we have some other middleware um, definitions, armor, invincibility, sanitizer. Uh, so invincibility makes sure that the H uh, damage is reduced to zero, and sanitizer does something like um, uh, the the um, damage cannot be minus one or lower than zero because you can only lose HP and not gain HP. And then here we have a ticker, which is poison. So it does damage over time. And here's the definition of uh, the, the dead reactor, which is referenced uh, up here. Uh, so this, this is all a bit, if, if you're not in, uh, too, too familiar with integrants or anything, it's kind of, it's probably a bit um, confusing. Um, but this is actual um, closure code. And this is where we um, actually define the functionality, write the functionality of these um, keys. So for example, here we have uh, reactor health dead. What this does is when uh, the component health of the new state is zero, then we print you died. That's basically all it does right now. So it's not very exciting, but you see that there's actually a change um, in what in what happens. So if 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 the state changes any, uh, at any point, it does this check and it uh, prints this line. So here here we have a middleware, uh, and what what uh, what this does is it updates the event that comes in, it updates event damage, and it decreases it by one. So you could, for example, have um, a piece of state that says how much armor you have, and you can just decrease it by the amount of armor that you would have. But this is just an example um, that you're decreasing it by one. And here we have the invincibility definition. And all it really does here is in the event, it just says uh, damage is now zero. So if the damage was 100, then it just gets reduced to zero, and the health component doesn't get any damage at all. Uh, then we have here the sanitizer, and what this does is it has to be, uh, it updates it with max zero, so that meaning that if it's lower than zero, it will um, get set to zero, so that you never uh, have this bug where if you accidentally send minus one damage that you gain one health, that's not uh, what's supposed to happen. Uh, and then here we have the definition of uh, the damage handler, and what this does, it, it updates the state, it says, well, now component health um, will get, uh, will be updated with the apply damage event. And what this does um, is it takes the current health and it does minus the um, event damage or the damage get given from the event and does max zero. But this is technically speaking not necessary anymore because we have a middleware to handle that. So we're basically removing this concern here because we wrote middleware that actually does this for you. So now the handler actually becomes simpler because um, all these checks and validations can be um, done somewhere else. So a little refactor there. Uh, and then here's the component itself. And really all it does is just re uh, return state. So it's uh, a map with component health and the amount that you give it. Um, uh, at the initialization. And here we also, it's a bit more complex. Uh, this is the poison ticker. Uh, and what this does, it returns a function um, that uh, whenever a, the game loop uh, runs, 
uh, every second it will reduce it the it will send an, uh, a damage event to uh, reduce reduce the component player's health currently uh yeah that's that but this um this is still a bit of work in progress so yeah. um i can show i can show you what this looks like in my browser but i have to re-log i think because oh wait, actually no i don't have to i think i think i could stop presenting and then select uh, meet so i hope that you can see this if anyone can confirm yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so so here um we uh, basically have the player um, as a sprite just standing there and running a single animation. Uh, we have here three buttons. So this is ja JavaScript. Uh, uh, I'm currently building this mainly on uh, Clojure script, but I'm building everything in Clojure C. So um, it, it should be compatible with uh, Clojure as well. So we have um, scene transitions. If you click on this event, you actually go to a different scene. Uh, but this player is defined in both scenes right now. Um, you have a uh, attack button, which changes the animation of um, the current sprite. And we also have here this uh, poison button, which actually um, adds the poison ticker. And then you see that this health is being uh, reduced by one. Uh, I think, oh, well, this is a bug, I guess. Um, maybe I didn't add the middleware, actually. It's a bit annoying that I can't show you my entire screen because I actually want to go back to Emacs right now. Um, let's see. Window. Uh, so if we go to this part here, or actually no, uh, so this is just plain um, closure scripts on the right side. And what we did here is we, um, sorry, we add um, the poison to any entities and we just say do damage uh, do two damage over 40 ticks. So uh, it does 80 damage total. And every time, every second you uh, receive two damage. But we had this middleware. Um, I think it was in the health. One. We had this armor middleware uh, attached. And what this does was it decreased it by one. So um, if you if you saw that, then um, the damage that we were receiving was one every tick instead of two. But that was because we had a middleware that was actually intercepting these uh, events and um, making it that uh, you uh, that we weren't taking two damage. So it's it's basically so that's this part. And you could you could also um, uh, make it reduce to two, and this would allow you to. Um, this th this would mean that if you add that poison again, then you wouldn't take any damage. So, uh, uh, so I think of a few interesting things about this. Um, let's see. Um, Basically, this is the actual game loop. We get any events, and we basically reduce them over the middleware, changing the state of the events, then passing them through the handlers, and then through the reactors. And if any state changes, the reactors get um, get uh, emitted. I'm not really sure how I can um, show the integrant parts because that's really that's this is really um, what integrant is. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, then feel free to ask. Um, but if we go to 
this. So, so you have, um, you know, these init keys, those are the actual implementations of the, these keys here. So uh, we have a armor key on the right here, and then this would be the implementation. When you start the system, so in, Interprint is actually mainly used for um, building system applications like web servers. And the whole point is that you have this dependency tree where uh, you, for example, have a web server that you need to start, and then you start all uh, your attach all your handlers. But before you do that, you need to have a database connection, which is um, depend uh, which is dependent on by the uh, the handlers itself to do database queries for getting users, for example. So this is there's this whole dependency tree, and the way we're using that here is you have a component health, but it's dependent on the reactors and handlers that you define in them. So you need to first start them. And for example, this handler is dependent on a certain middleware. So you have this um, entire tree um, of um, entities, components, and handlers and things uh, that get built up at the start. And you have this giant map of data, basically. And this, uh, which, which defines your game and this gets passed into the, the game loop. So after that, once that's passed in, you have all these events you can emit. And it um, basically cha changes your game state over time. But you still have this base configuration that you build up from the start. And that's uh, the idea behind that. Another thing that's pretty interesting about this is that um, def methods are actually not that fast. They're uh, compared to functions, they're really slow. Uh, and in a game loop, you you actually don't want to use def methods. That's actually a big um, a big thing because that really hurts your performance. You actually just want to use actual functions. But what I'm doing with um, Integrant is I'm initializing all these init keys, um, but I'm actually returning uh, or creating functions out of them. So to be used later. So I'm defining functions in these init keys. Uh, and once I actually need them, you're just applying anonymous functions. And that's why I'm also naming these functions. So for example, here, this one is middleware health armor. And the reason I'm doing that is because um, these anonymous functions are the ones are, um, are the ones that I get called uh, in the in the uh, game loop. So uh, if if an error occurs somewhere then in the in the logs, you'll actually see this name uh, in the in the console, and so you know actually where this is being used. Uh, graphics to do. Another thing that's pretty interesting about this as well is that I'm using Molly for data validation, and so for example, here we have a built-in component which is um, built into the game framework to. Uh, draw sprites, and it, it expects uh, either a map with a sprite name, a sprite frame, which is a um, uh, an image in the sprite sheet, or an animation, which is a collection of um, of sprites. But you could also uh, request a certain texture. And so, if you if you don't know, Molly is basically a data driven. Uh, closure spec. So you can define your whole specification in data and um, use um, use that for data validation. And so if you were to start the system and you configure it incorrectly that, for example, you forget to add the sprite sheet name, then the system will not start up and it'll, it'll say that your configuration is invalid because you're referencing this specific key, but you're missing a sprite sheet name. So that's also a very interesting, and uh, I'm not using spec um, because the problem I have with spec is that um, it's built on ma macros. And the really nice thing about Molly is that because it's data driven, you can actually um, read it um, afterwards and really inspect it in, in a very detailed way. 
the reason that I'm doing ev uh, everything in, in data as well is because I want to create a graphics uh, graphical editor which manipulates your Eden. So now what I've been showing you, I've been editing Eden files and, and um, doing it all by hand. But my end goal really is that uh, you have an external editor that looks in your Eden files and um, builds a UI out of that. That that's actually um, or that's one of my goals for this project. Uh, but I uh, I'm not there right now. I have been playing with um, uh, what's it called uh, Instaparse for. Uh, I could also show that maybe if I have... If, if you care about performance, can you hear me or...? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, if you care about performance, I would also not use Instaparse. Uh, uh, unless you, unless you uh, parse only once, uh, like at the start of your game or something. No, but the, 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 the parsing is only for the, for the game editor. So it's not it's not actually embedded uh, in your game. Oh, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Yep. So so it's. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Uh, so... Because I made an editor that um, changes function definitions from outside of um, uh, outside of the actual code, which was pretty interesting. I could also show that because it's kind of a work in progress thing. Um, and then, um, which is uh, a editor that I built in Electron right now. So, Let's see if I can do this. Oh, it's still compiling. Uh, just as a reminder, you yeah, you are only sharing uh, Emacs, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, let me just uh, I'm trying to open the uh, the application. So. Hopefully it opens. Would be nice. Okay, so this works. Okay, this is awesome. Um, let me just share this then. Yeah, it's very very annoying that I can't share my entire screen. It's very very unfortunate. So uh, let's see. Okay. Um, oh no, I can't show you the file. Of course, then. Oh, damn. Okay. Well, uh, I just made a file. Um, which was example.clj, and I actually um, wrote this part in there. And this is a Electron app that uses Instaparse to parse a specific file and get all the def and definitions out of it. I could also use um, nREPL, probably. Uh, that's also why I've been looking into that, uh, to get all the function definitions of a certain namespace with um, a line position. But right now I'm using Instaparse and uh, looking up certain um, function definitions for that. And uh, if I so you, you basically want a parser for closure or closure script with, that attaches line information. Uh, line information. Or... Yeah, line and, line and column information. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I ha I also have a library for that because Babeshka also needs that. Okay. Well, I'll uh, maybe ask yeah, you about it later. It then. also works in Closure Script. So. Okay. Yeah. Because um, right now, uh, so so what what this does, if you were to um, change this and if you were to reload this file, then it actually gets changed in the file. So right now, I see um, there's only the foo function. You can't see this, but Please believe me, I'm adding another f function. Okay, tell me what function I should. Give me a function name to uh, write. Let's call Just... it Babashka. Babashka. And uh, what, what, is the, what is the body of Babashka? What should be in Babashka itself? Bash. Maybe Michiel can tell. 
All right, I'll do uh, bash as a symbol. So now if we refresh this, then here we now have a babusker function, which has uh, bash as uh, a symbol. And so you can edit this as well. If you were to reload, or wait, I didn't save. So if you um, were to write this and then save and then reload this application that it reloads the um, actual file or rereads it, then you see that actually gets saved in the file. So I'm now also um, editing this file. So I also want, uh, well, with Eden, it's a lot easier because we have Eden parser. Uh, but I want to be able to read Eden files, uh, parse them, edit them, and also show them information like, for example, what are the required keys uh, for this piece of data? And what is documentation for that? And that's also a thing that's really nice about Molly is that you um, can add uh, documentation or you can add properties which can reflect as documentation. But this is a really uh, simple editor that I uh, made and I learned Insta parse while doing that it was really interesting. Um, but the idea is that I'm I'm going to create a editor like this to um, so that you don't have to write Eden and you get a customizable interface for the game engine. Uh, so you want you want to write uh, closure instead of Eden, right? That's the idea. Um, no. Well, you have the the closure part, which is the the actual functionality. So, for example, um, what what happens when you take damage? So you decrease your health by one. That part is you write that in closure. Um, but the idea is that if you, for example, create a new entity which has a sprite this editor should reflect that. So you would have a little screen with your sprite draw, drawn on it and your mouse, and you should be able to drag that sprite around with your mouse. And what that done, then does is it changes your Eden file to reflect that change that you did in the graphics, uh, in the uh, graphics yeah. UI. I get that, but this screen, what is exactly this screen for? Defn, foo, et cetera, or the functions that you are listing? This is it's reading this uh, this this UI is reading this file um, in example.clj, and it it looks in this file to uh, all the functions and lists them here. Oh and yeah, this this is for exactly so that okay I understand your question. This is for um, editing closure exactly. So you would have two parts uh, in this editor where you change the data. So you can for example move a sprite and then it changes the x and y position in your Eden. And then you can say, OK, I want to change the functionality of a component or a handler. And then what it should do, it should look up the def method and um, put the, the body of the def method in, in here that you could edit. So you don't actually have to edit, uh, open a text editor to change functionality. You can do it directly in here. So it also becomes okay. a, a scripting tool. Right. Yeah, I think uh, you're already using Molly, right? Yes. And Molly already already uses my uh, parser, so you probably okay. already have, have this on your class path now. So Okay. Well I I I I I'll, I'll send the, you a link. Yeah, after definitely. The, that would be really cool. Because I'm I'm just really just trying things out and uh, just exploring a lot. So uh, I, I'm I'm really just learning basically. So any any feedback is very welcome. Is there any code somewhere on GitHub that we can already look at? Um, no, currently it's uh, still private. Uh, I, I want to. Um, I, I'm still. I'm still not very happy with. Uh, well, I, I, I could uh, open source it right now, I guess, but I, I, I don't have a name right now, so which is also a thing. I, I don't really want to show it. Show it. Uh, show it off right now. I think. Yeah, that's that's okay. It's uh, yeah. we're just uh, curious. But maybe I can uh, think of something. And uh, can I can I see back to, to one of the things which are difficult in games is uh, managing time and making sure that things that have to happen at the same time happen at the same time. Can can I see uh, some code about that that you have in your engine? Um, so exactly, what what is uh, the problem that you're? Uh, saying things like uh, uh, 
making sure that animations uh, happen within the time constraints that they have and uh, uh, that events that happen all over the place uh, execute are applied at the right time. Yeah, OK. Um, let me just open Emacs again. Uh, let's see this one. Oh, yeah, so uh, here you can uh, see the file that actually exists. So that's pretty funny. Um, so this is the core loop. Um, so there's um, a few parts of this. So this is the closure loop version. That's, that's not really well tested. Uh, this is the closure script part. And you basically have your basic delta definition for time. And um, and when, when whenever you're done processing your uh, your loop, you um, request an, another animation frame, so you actually just repeat everything. So you have here the run scenes function. Um, you get all your scenes, and these should these should be ordered by z index. So you could have, for example, a UI scene that's above the actual game. So you would have um, um, if um uh, if, if you want to make sure that, that they're drawn at the proper order you would have some sort of z index uh, uh let's see and so first of all we actually um over here we actually run the game loop so this is actually where it processes all the events uh first thing it does is it processes any key. So this is the start of the, the uh, loop. First, it processes any key events. So if the person uh, types anything, it gets processed um, first. Then uh, any uh, tickers that are active, for example, the poison get processed, and it gets the delta and the current time of the game. So it uses that to actually um, make sure that uh, it gets process properly so it, it makes sure well if if a, sec, a second hat a second doesn't have uh, hasn't passed yet so I could show that in here so for example here in the, in the poison handler uh, ticker it has a last time um, if it's um, if the if, if a second hasn't passed yet then don't don't do anything but if it has then it actually um, emits the event and um, does that. But it, it um, basically looks at these, uh, let's see, the context. Oh, okay, so yeah, context key. And actually looks at the current time. And then it um, has an atom up here that actually um, keeps the state. So you so you have an atom outside of this function defined, but you reference it inside of this function so it doesn't lose, um, so that it stays in context, uh, in scope, I mean, excuse me. And it uses that to actually um, make sure that it, every second it gets emitted. So that, that's those two parts. Then we actually get all the events and we loop over them. And this, this is actually pretty interesting because uh, we um, we get all the current events and we process them. And once we're done processing them, we actually recur again with new events that have been emitted from uh, from processing. And once that happens, and um, the uh, events are finally um, done, then it actually stops. So uh, basically, the, the, the way that it really works is you first have key events, then you have your tickers, and then you have um, handling events. So you have middleware handlers and reactors doing their job. And then finally, down here, once all that data processing is done, it actually um, runs the graphics. So that's what you saw with the little character animation. And then it runs the physics engine. And that's that's really the order that it does, and I don't know um, of what priority you we would have to think of um, if if you have like event driven 
um, so, so it, it basically just looks at the 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 uh, the order of events that you've emitted, and that that's um, really determines how things are processed. You could, for example, add ordering as well for that, but I'm not really sure if that's necessary. All right, thanks. Cool. Right, do we have any further questions? Yes, I have one. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Um, so you're using Integrant for setting up your initial state and, and mm -hmm. uh, 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 making this graph of all your handler functions. I yeah. see a lot of anonymous functions. How do you yeah. do, deal with live coding? So if you want to update your function, it uh, looks like you would have to restart your entire tree of, of uh, uh, initial state and new handler functions. How do you deal with it? Right. So uh, Integrant has a suspend and resume function. What that, what that does is once you initialize your state, your state is set in stone. But for development, it has a suspend uh, key. So here we run the um, Integrant suspend um, on our system. And then we halt all, all our scenes. And um, once, your, once everything is compiled, then actually it resumes it again. And um, it just takes your new configuration and resumes all the halted scenes. So if you change any uh, multi-methods or anonymous functions, they all get reloaded uh, uh, at, uh, at development time. So you don't have to worry about that. So, so and, and your initial state is not overwritten. You keep your current state. Yeah, so um, I could... Right. Uh, basically, what you can do is if you have um, a component, yeah. So, so you the components are the only ones that actually have state. So, if you want to preserve uh, any state at all, it would be preserving any components. So, if we go to um, um, this part, you can have a. Um, uh, you can add a key definition to your components. I'm not sure if I actually did that for this. Um, basically, if you have a component with these uh, reactors and handler definitions, you can also add. Um, you can also um, add a persistent key and set that to true. And what that does, whenever you uh, change scenes or whenever you reload the code, instead of um, initializing the component state again, it actually um, uh, it actually gets uh, the persistent state from an atom. So whenever you um, change any state, it saves it um, separately from the component. And whenever you reload the component, then it actually gets it from that uh, separated state. So you e even if you um, so if, for example, you want to preserve the position, then you have a way of doing that. OK, thank you. All right. Do we have any more questions for Kevin? I mentally counted up to three, no further questions. So I guess, uh, thank you very much for sharing with us the, the, your, your bleeding edge gaming engine. Yeah, very bleeding edge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so it's already half uh, hours in the, the meetup. I would like to actually wrap it up. So. Yeah, um, my feeling is that it actually went uh, very well, especially thanks to the impromptu presentations from Michiel and Kevin that made this event awesome. Um, so thank you guys so much for uh, for the content of this meetup. Um, I will. I, I'm not sure if the the next meetup is gonna have a similar format as this one, uh, meaning online only. It depends a little bit on how the 
global health uh, situation develops. So we'll we'll see. Um, so far, so good, I would say. Uh, and uh, let's have a look at how the recording uh, recordings are gonna uh, work out. And uh, well, from my side, seems it's uh, at least a doable, not as enjoyable as uh, you know, uh, shaking your hands, uh, virus-free hands, and uh, enjoying uh, a beer or a tea with you guys, but still enjoyable nonetheless. All right, uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you uh, for participating to this uh, remote event of the Dutch Closure Meetup and uh, see you next time. Thank see you next time. time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Goodbye.